Again, thanks, Jason, for taking the time to uh, join us for the class and uh, again to do the live case for NT401. So I'll, I'll just hand it off to you. No, thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. And uh, I guess, you know, depending on when you're watching this, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to, uh, to everyone. And again, Chris, thanks for this warm uh, invitation. Um, you know, I've previously presented to students of, uh, of this very course, so I'm, I'm happy to be here once again. Um, as I'm sure, uh, you know, I'm not sure if folks have, have read my, my bio, but uh, I'm the Director of Strategy at Calgary Economic Development, um, but I'm technically also still a University of Calgary uh, PhD student, so uh, it's great to be amongst uh, fellow U of C uh, peers today. Um, it doesn't get said enough. Um, but I do want to uh, congratulate you on, on taking this course, furthering your, your education, reaching the last sort of year, year and a half of my, uh, my own PhD journey myself. Um, I can say with confidence that you'll never regret uh, pursuing greater learning and knowledge, whether it comes through this course or, or something else. And, and I know, uh, as Chris and I were, were speaking uh, before we started this recording, that I think we'll be a better city for, for you having done so. So congratulations. Um, today, uh, I have the good fortune of discussing with you how we build a new economy for Calgary in the context of uh, your NT401 course on opportunity identification. Um, and when while I'll spend a, a brief amount of time outlining the current state of affairs within, within Calgary's economy, the bulk of my, my presentation will be spent on, on where things are going. Uh, and, and more importantly, where Calgary could be. Uh, so as I mentioned, for just over a year, I've been serving as the Director of Strategy at Calgary Economic Development, where uh, I'm responsible for leading uh, all of our core research uh, that we produce, and we produce a, a fair bit of it, uh, but also leading the implementation of our Calgary in the New Economy strategy, which is our, our community's economic strategy. And I'll, I'll get into uh, exactly what that means in a moment, uh, but rather than just diving in there, uh, I actually thought it would be best to start here. Uh, so let's get that big question out of the way. What is an economic development agency? Because uh, even when I started to, to where I am now about a year later, it's, it's very poorly understood. And, uh, and I'll tell you why. I'm sure Chris has talked to you about uh, marketing, communications, having a very, very clear message. Uh, economic development is, is oftentimes not uh, uh, an entity that has uh, a very clear message. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this time last year, I was in um, uh, Indianapolis for the International Economic Development Council's uh, annual meeting, uh, and I had to give a speech there. And they played a video titled, What is Economic Development? And it went on for, I think, the better part of three minutes. And it was literally someone, uh, an economic development professional in every city uh, around the world saying what economic development was. And all of them had a different answer. Uh, economic development was uh, labor uh, force training. Economic development was placemaking. Economic development was research. Economic development was policy, economic, and so on and so on and so forth. And so I, I just wanna clear a bit of that up and provide you with a little more insight into what an economic development agency is and, and particularly what, what we are at CED. And so Calgary Economic Development, uh, our mandate is to work with the business, government, and community partners to attract business investment, uh, foster trade, and grow Calgary's workforce. Uh, so essentially, between all of those entities I just described, we, we play a broker role uh, in an ecosystem that spans a lot of diverse value propositions and attempts to focus them for the benefit of our city and our people, primarily our economy. And so you can imagine the priorities of, of business, of government and community might not always be in lockstep. And so that's where we can play a role to, to help this community and our economy get to a win. Uh, CED is a, is a not-for-profit corporation in structure and it's a civic partner of the city of Calgary, but it operates at an arm's length. Uh, and that's important because it allows us the opportunity to partner where most advantageous uh, with the city, but also remain really, really close to the business, academic, uh, small C community, who ultimately are our clients and who we want to, to, to deliver for. In other cities, the Economic Development Agency actually sits 
within the capital C city structure. And so we're, I think we're really grateful for that flexibility and agility that we're provided in the current um, structural form. Uh, our overall operating budget ranges between 10 and $12 million, uh, and approximately half of that is funded by an operating grant uh, from the city of Calgary. Um, just over a million dollars uh, of our budget is raised from the private sector through our Team Calgary program, and, and that features about 70 plus private companies. Um, underneath our organizational umbrella is the Calgary Film Center. So this is a you know hard piece of infrastructure where you know some of Hollywood's leading films and, and TV shows are filmed. Uh, you know most recently Ghostbusters uh, was filmed in in Calgary, and certainly we've uh, managed to even during COVID uh, keep the place booked, which is great. Uh, we have Startup Calgary, which actually sits within uh, my research and strategy department, um, which focuses on early stage, highly scalable companies and providing them with education, mentorship, and support. Um, and then finally, the Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund, where we manage $100 million uh, of public funding that is aimed at catalyzing new opportunities for the city that absorb underutilized space, which, uh, you know, tuck that under your cap because that'll be uh, the challenge that I post to you guys at the end of the uh, end of the presentation. Um, we, uh, the Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund uh, also has a mandate to create jobs and fill gaps in our business ecosystem. Uh, and, it, and it's interesting, you know, that $100 million uh, in an era where there's not a lot of innovations within government and government policy is actually a, a very thoughtful um, and healthy amount of risk that the, the city of Calgary has taken by saying, look, um, we, we should be filling in the gaps and the voids in the innovation ecosystem. The way that it's structured is not to just be a, a, a subsidy or a uh, a shiny tool to be able to attract folks. It's actually, if you look at the most recent investments, I would say within the last year is filling really, really critical gaps in our talent pipeline, in our innovation ecosystem, uh, the Life Science Innovation Hub, for example, at the University of Calgary is funded through the Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund. So um, I'll get into probably a little bit more of that in a moment. Um, but I wanted to begin with the formation of our, our community's economic strategy and why it's more important uh, now than ever. At CED, we're really rethinking how you write uh, and execute on, on strategy. And, and I've taken this from uh, uh, an article that I actually uh, authored with our, our economist in Public Sector Digest. Um, while other cities are struggling to execute these 10, 20, 30 year long visions, you know, we, we've created a model where we're quickly adapting to change and checking our assumptions uh, every three to four. So this economic strategy was born out of the challenges and, and pain of the 2014 downturn, which some of you um, who, were, who were based here in Calgary and Alberta might've been familiar with. Um, and it recognized the future is actually unknown, but it's underpinned in many ways by the adoption of transformative technologies. And so I'll, I'll, I'll take you back into time to 2014 and why some of the same issues that we've known were going to be either exacerbated, accelerated or worsened uh, represented an opportunity for us to improve as an economy. So the, the first thing is office vacancy. You know, people often talk about, uh, you know, what's what's behind Chris's screen right there. But but it's it's often a misunderstood problem. And I'll get into that in the challenge section on the back end. But vacancy has always been an issue. It's uh, we've known that at a certain point in time, the future of work is real. Uh, the way that we're connecting asynchronously now is real and it's cheap. So for many businesses, depending on how they operate with technology, depending on if they have a disaggregated workforce, they will have very, very little use case, depending on which sector they're in, for the hardbound infra infrastructure of a sort of class A or class B or C building. And so uh, that was the sort of red flag for us. The second red flag in, in 2014 was in the downturn in the energy sector was probably the biggest occupant of some of that office space. So depending on how we, we met the opportunity and challenge of an energy transition, there was going to be this lull period where a structural change represented a difference in this in the um, use of office space. And then the third is the, the, fact, the fact that we're just very frankly overbuilt. Um, you know, vacancy is often cited as, as an issue, but our absorption rate per square foot 
um, uh, in Calgary is actually on par or better than major markets, including Toronto and Vancouver. It's just the fact that we have too much of it. And while we think about those, just those towers in the court, there's a ton more office space. It's a little bit closer to the ground that doesn't often get counted as well. And so we've understood that, that the future of work and all the other factors that I, I mentioned would be an issue then and would be an issue now. The second is in 2014, high unemployment with the crash of the uh, of oil prices was an issue then and, and certainly is an issue now where, where Calgary is one of the leading cities um, uh, post COVID in terms of how high our, our unemployment rate is. Uh, so that was a guiding, a guiding sort of focus and, and red flag for us. The third is something that is, is not necessarily overt and often discussed within our economy, but you know, this is one of the most expensive places for childcare. Um, you know, there's m multiple reports, uh, the Canadian center for policy alternatives has pointed out that, you know, uh, on a on a per household basis, the, the cost of childcare in Calgary and Alberta is markedly higher than other markets. Uh, lagging diversity, uh, a, a city that was changing in its ethno-cultural makeup, which I'll get into later, uh, was certainly again an issue then and an issue now. Uh, but but while I focused on some of these structural challenges, there were also bench strengths. Uh, we have a well-educated workforce, one of the highest educated workforces uh, in the entire country, particularly in the amount of STEM graduates that we we. Uh, push out of our universities. The challenge is, is that some of the skills requirements are changing from, you know, geothermal engineers um, to now people needing new new skill sets in data science and computer science. We also had a, a, a very big strength in big established companies having either headquarters or a substantial presence uh, within our city. And many of them possess either purchasing power or huge uh, uh, amounts of data. And, and certainly that's a competitive advantage within a, a quote unquote new economy that needs to leverage technology. And so what you can see here from a guiding principle perspective is, is the first that our strategy needed to be formulated on the basis of, of really good research. And so we, we've really, really, I think, embraced some of the principles that you see below. Um, it's, it's a long-term strategy, but in many ways, uh, as I've, I've pointed out, is well matched to the issues that have been longstanding in our community that COVID has, has merely accel accelerated and in other ways uh, exposed. And so while other cities are using traditional approaches that just monitor macro level changes in their economies, we're trying to link those macro, meso and micro level actions to show that change truly can happen from, from the bottom up and not just the top down in our city. So I, I just pointed to them and I'll, and I'll pick it up again. Strategy is bolstered by three guiding principles. First is allowing data to drive our insights, stakeholders leading the way and remaining focused on a, an aspirational vision. So that is why you see multinational firms like uh, Boston Consulting Group uh, and KPMG, not only contributing to our strategies development, um, but in many ways standing behind our organization and community as we seek to implement it. Um, you know, I was uh, had the privilege of being named to uh, um, a BCG program uh, for emerging leaders. And I was shocked that as they, you know, uh, introduced us to BCG representatives from around the world, that all of them were very familiar with their work on Calgary's economic strategy. And so that lends to the credibility of how much they put their weight behind this. Um, that is why more than 1,800 community and business stakeholders were engaged in the crafting of this roadmap so that there is no doubt who this strategy is meant to serve. Um, and finally, that is why nearly 25 of the top business, government, and community leaders in our city formed the CEO Roundtable to ensure our strategy was guided by the voice, engagement, and support of the Calgary business community. And, and that's why our work is powered by a simple vision. And that vision is that Calgary becomes the city of choice for the world's best entrepreneurs who embrace technology to solve some of the world's greatest challenges, including cleaner energy, safe and secure food, the efficient movement of goods and people and better health solutions. A place that stands out not because it has all the answers, but because we'll run through a brick wall to get them. That's the kind of city that we want to be building together. And that's where you can see that entrepreneurial spirit needing to shine through. So why I say this couldn't be more current and, and relevant. In an era where we're facing crashing oil prices, uh, in many places, food security issues, 
challenging supply chains and global health pandemic, um, it's a great thing that our core bench strengths are a very diverse energy sector, which I'll go into uh, probably later in the in the presentation. Uh, while a lot of attention is focused on on oil and gas and uh, natural gas, we have a, a competitive advantage in clean tech and ranked as a as a top global ecosystem. I think it's three or or four of the top five uh, named clean tech companies on the Narwhal list are actually based out of Calgary. So there's a very diverse energy picture here um, that often gets gets missed. And there's there's also a hundred million dollar federal initiative, uh, the Clean Resource Innovation Network, again, housed right here in Calgary. On the food security front, um, that has not been a particular challenge for a place bolstered by a very, very resilient agribusiness sector, which again, in Alberta, has I think fifth, a fifth of the available farmland in Canada, which again, positions us very well for economic recovery. Uh, from a supply chain perspective, we are known as an inland port with huge bench strength in transportation and logistics, which is why you didn't see, you know, a ton of service stop within our city in terms of sourcing PPE and other things. Um, certainly maybe deployment challenges, but certainly not access. And then lastly, from a global health pandemic, literally your institution, the University of Calgary, is one of the major global entities tapped for leading research on how we uh, produce a vaccine how we manage the public health crisis based on the expertise, not only in the Cummings School of Medicine, but the O'Brien Institute for, for Public Health. These are, the, these are the core bench strengths that I'm talking about, um, uh, sort of uh, enacted in evidence um, based on the makeup of our, our, our economy. So in Calgary, the new economy, as you can see from the screen, there are four interconnected pillars and uh, we've made a great deal of progress in, in implementation uh, through 2019 and, and 2020. And all of this has been powered by the adoption of, of emergent technology, which is expected to reach a, a total digital spend of over $18.4 billion by 2022 in Alberta, according to the International Data Corporation of, of Canada. And, and best believe that Calgary companies will be leading that charge because of what I just said before, having the size, having the, 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 the large employee base, but also having the data to actually action some of that digital uh, digital spending. And, and just so you know, keep your eyes peeled um, uh, to Calgary economic development because we're, you know, while that work was done uh, pre-COVID, we've worked with the International Data Corporation of Canada to sort of caveat any sort of during COVID changes to say digital transformation business investments have actually proved quite resilient. We're seeing an increase in that type of investment and the non-digital transformation investments uh, actually go down. Um, so we're actually revamping and renewing that study and would be happy to share that with you to see how that $18 billion uh, is going to shake out post-COVID. Uh, that aspirational vision I spoke of earlier is embedded in every part of this strategy. We wish to be Canada's destination for talent. We aim to be Canada's most livable city. We strive to house Canada's leading B2B innovation ecosystem. And we seek to be Canada's most business friendly city. Now, I want to make clear, not all of those aspirations are rooted in a strength. Some are actually rooted in, in a weakness in many ways in our economy. And it is up to us, our city's companies, governments, uh, academics, and others to address them through, through this framework. So what I'll spend in the next, say, you know, 20 minutes or, uh, or so going over is the strides that we're making in talent, innovation, business environment, and place to give you uh, an overview of not only the momentum that's building underneath the surface for Calgary, but, but the work that still actually needs to be done. And so scaling the, the, the talent you, you need, uh, this is a sort of vision of, uh, I think, you know, Calgary's tech talent today in particular. It's, it's often the, the biggest question that we, that we get. And so you can see that, you know, technology job growth within our economy is, sorry, outpacing um, uh, job growth elsewhere, uh, nearly six to one. Uh, we've seen a, a huge jump in the demand for, for tech skills and, and, and tech training, growth in, in, in certainly software development. Um, and lastly, you know, this focus on uh, a different kind of pipeline in our economy, uh, a tech talent pipeline. How are you 
you know, coming out of a, a degree from the, the University of, of Calgary, um, going to be some of the difference makers and have the skill sets to be able to help some of these leading companies that we work with uh, scale. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see some of those macro stats that I told you about in terms of science, technology, engineering and, and mathematics. Um, and, you know, for the first time, uh, there was a tech talent um, scoring released by a research entity called CBRE. Calgary had never placed on it because the, the tech sort of focus that we had um, within the oil and gas sector and, and others was never the kind of tech talent that they were scoring for the first time we placed on it um, uh, on a North American basis. So we clearly know that we're, we're heading in the right direction and able to meet the future of work and, and its demands. Um, we work very, very closely with our, our post-secondaries. And I know that there were some questions submitted about, you know, things that uh, you're most proud of, uh, investments that you've helped steward. Um, and I'm happy within the vein of talent to, to talk about one that I was uh, playing a heavy hand in uh, over the last uh, six or so months. Um, so this in the left-hand side is actually SAIT's School for Advanced Digital Technology. It's in the Odd Fellows building, which actually used to be the old uh, Calgary Chamber of Commerce. It's actually right next door across the street to my office on the right-hand side of that image, which is the, the Bow Tower. And so when, uh, I think this was in about December, actually one of the last times that I um, uh, taught or helped a guest lecture for one of Chris's classes was likely December, um, David Bissett, a local philanthropist um, in Calgary, uh, made a very, very powerful donation of $30 million to SAIT to build the school that you see uh, on the left-hand side of, of the screen. And what that allowed uh, SAIT to do um, in working not only with private industry brokers like us and others was to, to form a vision for how, what is going to anchor this tech talent pipeline that we need, but also forget about hard tech, forget about you know the, the Googles uh, or even the in-market bigger tech companies like Benevity and so on, who's going to manage the digital transformation and the talent transition from those who are engineers, those who are not working in tech, how are we going to navigate an era where digital transformation is going to be a core competency that Calgarians need? And so what was very clear is that underneath the umbrella of the School for Advanced Digital Technology, you know, we needed to make an investment in digital transformation talent. And what you see here is, is an overview of the SAIT DX Talent Hub, which will offer very, very integrated programs um, in digital transformation in a continuing education environment. So for, for individuals and corporate workforces. And so let me break down what that means. You know, I've, I've often talked uh, with Chris about the fact that when uh, so many folks come to, to post-secondary, present company excluded, you know, if they don't have uh, experience or access to um, technology, private industry, uh, unique volunteering uh, opportunities, it becomes wholly difficult later on in life to be able to get those skills. So why not start early? So what the Safety X Talent Hub is going to do is start to provide those opportunities, those capstone challenges, those internship opportunities actually in K-12. Part of their offerings will also be in um, helping current students within the state environment or potentially within other institutions like the UFC um, get access to competency and pathway mapping tools. So you could place yourself as a student on a spectrum of digital transformation and know what skills you needed to work on to meet the demands of industry and employers who are looking to hire folks all the way through to the to the back end of someone who potentially works in agribusiness, works in uh, transportation and logistics as a rail operator, for instance, who is going to give them the training that they need to be able to match the demands of their role three years from now when much of it is either augmented by AI, automated in many cases, um, or allow them to actually drive business value with some of their traditional knowledge paired with technology. And that's where this is gonna be very industry facing. Uh, last but not least, it's also going to offer these very, very macro citywide challenges, hackathons, et cetera. So again, from our perspective, I mentioned that downtown office vacancy, uh, potentially a lack of vibrancy that results as, as part of empty buildings. This will take up a, a huge chunk of, of office space and have students actually coming downtown, which is a big part of, of any city's vibrancy. And so over the next five years, the hope is that this, uh, this hub will graduate 1,500 individuals. And uh, this investment in particular was made possible through that Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund that I mentioned earlier, which again filled a key gap in, in our ecosystem. 
I'll just go through very, very briefly um, the work that we're doing broadly in talent uh, around that tech side, which is, you know, Alta ML, another investment made through the Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund to create a center of excellence. And so these are data science internships that I've said, you know, in many cases, some of our post-secondaries were not offering or didn't have the direct connection to industry to really scale. So here you're going to see 240 graduates and hopefully 240 in-market hires. Um, and Alta ML, again, a leading company from Edmonton, now having a presence in Calgary is a great thing. Partnering with ACB Financial and Spartan Controls and, uh, and recently Suncor Energy as well, also super, super beneficial for, for our local economy. The other thing we can offer um, in terms of the state of our economy, as you can see, is, is cost savings on tech talent. As many of these markets that you're seeing that we often get compared to when it comes to tech uh, become overheated or the quality of life is poor uh, or the, the cost of living in San Francisco or in some of these markets is so high that in order for anyone to justify living in Manhattan or San Francisco, you would need to pay them, as you can see, $180,000, $314,000, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here's where we have a huge advantage, where the cost of living, as I'll get into later, is actually quite low. Um, and thus, you know, we can pay, you know, largely above the average salary in Canada here for tech talent, but certainly not have to, to, to play the game of all of these other overheated markets uh, of being able to compete. So for companies, they can get, you know, access to relatively cost effective talent right here in our city. So that's a, a little bit of an overview of, of the talent color. The second I'll get into is, is our growing innovation ecosystem. What you see here, obviously pre-COVID, is uh, Launch Party, um, which takes place at, uh, at the Big Four uh, on the Stampede grounds and brings together all of these uh, you know, core um, components of our innovation ecosystem, venture capital funders, uh, academics, um, brokers in the ecosystem like us, entrepreneurs, government officials, et cetera, to really celebrate you know, the growth happening within the early stage and scaling startup space uh, when it comes to technological innovation. And so you might've seen this recently, uh, the government of Alberta you know, uh, you know, is, is you know, released the early stages of an innovation strategy, but I think a full strategy and more fulsome uh, strategies is to be revealed soon. Uh, which basically signals their commitment to taking innovation seriously. Now, there's a very sort of traditional way of, of doing that in terms of helping business friendliness, which you can see they've, they've accelerated a job creation tax cut. But in most cases, most businesses need access to talent, um, access to uh, very, very targeted grants versus these more macro grants that might not filter down to them. So on the bottom half, you see some of these key elements, you know, a, an innovation employment grant, uh, to be able to get a tax credit for, for research and development expenditures, $175 million investments to support uh, venture funding to the Alberta Enterprise Corporation, further investments in Alberta Innovates um, and uh, within the AI and machine learning component uh, of our economies, both in Edmonton and in Calgary, uh, have already been announced as well. And so we're working very, very much, as I told you our mandate is, to work with the government of Alberta to make sure that that innovation strategy actually reaches the full spectrum of what we're calling, you know, our innovation corridor within Calgary and, and Edmonton. I mentioned this earlier, Calgary has a, a huge advantage when it comes to having big companies that have data and can actually make big moves. And so Calgary is for decision makers, 118 head offices in Calgary, and you can see on a per capita basis how that stacks up across the board. Surprise, surprise, why we have so much office space is likely because of that. Um, but we also have diverse sectors. And so Calgary in the new economy is also powered by, by sectors that we know are, are part of our established mix and will be for a period of time. So that's your, your energy, your agribusiness, your transportation and logistics. But increasingly, we've done a lot of study on what our emerging sectors are going to be and how do we foster the investment and interest in those sectors to make sure that as companies grow, they have the talent to scale, they have the access to funding, uh, et cetera. So one of them, again, is life sciences. And you can point to investments in things like the Life Science Innovation Hub at the University of Calgary. But increasingly, film and TV, aerospace and defense, financial services, and also the, the creative industries. And that's everything from you know, the traditional side of film and TV, but also arts and culture, interactive digital media, gaming, increasingly becoming a focus for us as part of our emerging sectors. As you can see, this is the full sort of, you know, uh, high level breadth and depth 
of diverse customers and employers uh, within, within the Calgary market. And so in each of these, you can see really, really big juggernauts like in agribusiness, Nutrien, in life sciences, Alberta Health Services, Financial ATB, and, and other general tech, you know, Shaw, uh, a Calgary-based company. But increasingly, you're, you're going to see some of these names um, get bigger and bigger and bigger that you might not be as, as familiar with. So this is to show you, while everyone sort of focuses on, on the companies that may make the newspaper or get that photo op, there are tons just plugging away, hiring folks, providing good services for not only local customers, but customers out of market uh, around the world. I mentioned the, the digital transformation across all industries. And so when I mentioned that $18.4 billion number um, that's going to be spent through 2022, you can see actually where that, that breaks down, um, not only by the type of technology, so you have uh, AI, IoT, ML, blockchain, AR, VR, but what does that actually mean for a sector? So in energy, and this is why we're having such a structural uh, change and challenge from an employment perspective in the energy sector is look at, look at the tech that you're, you're seeing being used. Uh, electrification, autonomous vehicles, uh, remote monitoring digital twin. Many of those by Unity, uh, Solero, uh, partnering with IBM for, for SAP, et cetera, et cetera. So we're having these big, big entities in our economy partnering with startups and scaling companies to augment their, their service and delivery. You know, recent mergers and acquisitions um, happening within our innovation ecosystem. Uh, many of you might not know this, but actually Calgary had two $1 billion deals last year in our economy. Uh, Shareworks um, uh, being purchased by Morgan Stanley um, and uh, Parvis Therapeutics, um, which is Calgary born actually being purchased and, and partnered with uh, Genentech. Uh, so there are deals happening within our economy that actually show us that we are building the solutions that the rest of the world needs, so much so that they're willing to pay a, a heavy price for it. Um, and again, part of our, our responsibility at CED is to really make sure that we're expanding notable companies into our, into our ecosystem. Uh, so these are just some of the, the key ones uh, that you'd be happy to explore, check out their websites um, over the next period of time to see what investments they're making within Calgary. Investments in Calgary, not just uh, people, uh, they're not just uh, office space, but it's actually about uh, deal flow. So it's about the investments that are actually happening in the companies themselves, not just in the market. And so as you can see, Calgary has, has made some noise. Uh, and I actually see there's a few uh, as of late that are missing from it. Uh, you can see the ones here, but uh, Orpix Medical Technologies just finished a 7.8 Series A million dollar raise. Athenian, which is a, a legal tech company, unveiled $10 million uh, in financing as well, uh, a combination of seed and Series A funding. And I want to make clear, in many ways, and, and Chris, I know, knows the CEO of, of Orpix, um, she's a medical doctor and, and resident within the University of, of Calgary, who's spun off and started this wonderful digital health therapeutics company, um, which manufactures uh, wearable technology. You have um, an entrepreneur, um, Adrian Kamar, is the CEO of Athenian, was a lawyer and, and noted some gaps within the governance framework on how you manage legal entities and identified that, oh my God, just like a nurse and a teacher and, and many other big systems, paralegals are the ones that are doing these remote, like these rote processes day in and day out in a really inefficient manner, sometimes on a typewriter, sometimes on a piece of paper that is getting faxed over and over again and found a way within the cloud as a lawyer himself to find a niche market, find how he could create value and do it right here uh, in the city. So uh, lots, to, lots to be very, very proud of in terms of investments in Calgary companies. The anchors for those companies can be found here. So who's gonna give people those, that mentorship, uh, that advice, that investment? Uh, so you can see here, you know, Creative Destruction Lab, which obviously has a partnership with the University of Calgary and Haskane, but also Zone Startups, which are, is focusing on agribusiness, District Ventures, which is led by, by Arlene Dickinson, Harvest, founded by the former CEO of Skip the Dishes, which we've actually invested in through the Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund as well to focus on fintech and prop tech opportunities within our city and so on and so forth. These are the kind of brokering relationships that I would say not only are we involved in, but I would say provide a brokering relationship as well back to the ecosystem. Certainly they want to drive value. Many of these are affiliated with their, their own companies, their own brands, certainly District Ventures tied in with Arlene. Uh, Harvest as an entity wants to be able to scale, 
but providing services that allow other companies to get the skill sets, access to capital, and scale that they will need to make a difference in this community. The last two are where we play a little bit uh, less closely to, but certainly um, we can highlight why Calgary wants to be a further business-friendly city, but on, a, on the basis of what I'm going to show you is already a, a pretty business-friendly city. So business friendliness really boils down to as well access. So how do we access the rest of the world? Obviously, as you can imagine, this was pre-COVID where uh, flights were a little bit more uh, easy to come by, but you can see that uh, Calgary's well positioned to go to, to, to other markets. Uh, market access, even from a, from a ground level, I mentioned our, our position as a uh, transportation and logistics hub. You can see whether it's by rail, by truck, et cetera, uh, well positioned to, to give market access um, for goods and services uh, out of Calgary. From a real estate space, uh, I would say, you know, second lowest commercial property taxes of major Canadian cities overall. Now, the plummeting value of Calgary office towers has changed where those property taxes get distributed, uh, which has posed some challenges that need to be solved. But on the macro um, level, still the second lowest commercial property taxes. Um, I'll get into a little bit of that availability when I introduce the, the challenge to you. But, but again, affordable, low total operating costs for businesses to operate out of the city, great amenities, easy train and, and bike access. This is what, uh, what often people don't know when you look at uh, what I call a Metter score, which is how do you take all of the taxes, provincial income, et cetera, property tax, bundle them all together, and where, do you, uh, where do you end up? Calgary from a city perspective is the fourth lowest global tax rate. Um, so you can see that it's not just you know a tax a competitive tax environment that it's needed to create a new economy. It's all those other pieces of talent, place making that we're getting into now, business friendliness, et cetera. Um, so again, outpacing Toronto, Vancouver, San Fran, and Seattle. Uh, no provincial sales tax again, uh, which creates a little bit of a revenue challenge for for governments, but certainly is not something born by consumer. And no payroll tax or healthcare premiums in our market. And so finally, on that place side of things, you know, we offer a world class quality of life. And I, and I want to couch this um, stat that you're going to see here. You know, we're often ranked on the Economist Intelligence Unit's annual list of the most livable cities in the world. Um, for the last few years, we've been ranked uh, in the top five. This year, we were ranked number five. Uh, and, and certainly from the global perspective, that left us as number one in, in North America. And our scores were high because of stability healthcare, education, and infrastructure. But I think it's important to, to you guys to know, whether it's within the context of this course or, or elsewhere, that this city remains highly unlivable for far too many. Um, when we talk about the income inequality gap within Calgary, where I showed you that even though we're cost of effective talent relative to overheated tech markets, um, the, the average salary in Calgary is actually quite high compared to other places. And so when you think of those who are struggling with addictions, or homelessness, or food or job insecurity. Think of the chasm that that creates in terms of livability and income inequality, access to childcare, et cetera. So do not be bolstered by the fact that while this is something to be very, very proud of, don't let it cloud the focus on how we need to bring about economic recovery and change for more than just the one or two people we know that are doing well, but certainly as a, as a city overall. This I don't need to, to, to you know, uh, talk you through too much because I think we all know this, right? Um, the proximity of the mountains is a huge attractor for us. What's, what's not as, as well known is that we have the largest bike path in North America. So these urban pathways that we have that run throughout our city, uh, which often are, are a correlation to creativity, um, uh, choice, health, and, and all these other things that, that lead to a high quality of life, can actually be pointed back to in many cities as the friendliness you have to people who want to ride bikes. Um, so it's really, really um, a privilege that we get to live and work and play here. Home affordability, um, you know, this is, a, this is a, a huge, huge boost for attracting talent. Um, uh, and you can see the comparators across some of these markets um, that have exploded over the next few uh, or last several years in terms of tech and innovation. You get more house compared to those other markets here, which again is a, a huge boost uh, as well, particularly um, if you've ever lived in Toronto as I have, in a very, very tiny bachelor apartment, which I did not want to move from because it was very centrally located on Bloor Young. 
but still it was it was very very tiny compare that to vancouver new york etc and you can get the picture of how good our advantage is here and the last thing i'll say is that um again while there's a lot to be proud of here uh around uh how, how much we've grown ethnoculturally um that we, we have a sizable population with over a third being of folks from diverse backgrounds diverse ethnocultural um uh, sort of traditions uh that again this is a place that that still um like most cities um can remain unfriendly at times to, to folks of color that, that we still have folks that are attracted to the promise of this place but because their credentials may be foreign uh, and not recognized in the city are, are underemployed. And that's very personal for me, not within the Calgary context, but my own father was educated in the UK as an automotive technician in the Commonwealth, literally in the Commonwealth, came to Ontario and had none of his credentials rec uh, recognized, had to start over from scratch, was resilient, uh, became very successful. But again, it shows how, how much harder some folks have to work. So when we think about a new economy and economic recovery, that should also be top of mind about what we have to celebrate, but the work that we have to do. And so I'll, I'll before I get into the grand challenge, um, I'll just make the point that like many other cities, Calgary's economy uh, is at a crossroads. And so having a roadmap like Calgary and the new economy will allow us to be disruptors in the new economy rather than the disrupted. But our success will be predicated upon our ability to band together, celebrate our community's achievements wholeheartedly, but remain you know, a tad bit unsatisfied so that we keep our very hungry, competitive nature and openness to change um, to be able to usher in new era, a new era of prosperity and health uh, for the city. If we do, Calgary will continue to be a prosperous city in wealth and culture for, for many, many years to come. And so with that, I'll introduce a little bit of a grand challenge that I have for you. And you might need to take notes because I'll just rapid fire throw some, some points at you that can help you understand what would your, what is the opportunity that is posed by a lot of this vacant or underutilized office space in Calgary's downtown commercial core? So you'll need to look at, you know, what is Calgary's downtown core actually defined as? Um, from an office space perspective, there's not all offices are the same. I mentioned the terms class A, B, and C. So class A would be like the very shiny, fancy building I showed you, uh, which is my office in that state graphic and the earlier slides. And then class B and C are the, are the mid-rise to lower level, four-story walk-up, concrete, uh, older office buildings that, that don't have as much value in the market. There's vacancy problems across the board, um, across all of those different classes as well. And so the challenge for you is that, okay, you have this dual, you know, triple, quadruple tsunami of things happening. You had a global price war that happened at the onset of COVID between OPEC and Russia that drove down um, the, the cost of oil per barrel, certainly forced a number of layoffs uh, within the energy sector, which again, were major tenants within these buildings. That's been happening on, on an ongoing basis since 2014. You have recent job cuts announced in some of the, the biggest office holders in the Calgary market, like Suncor, as we go through a structural change just in the makeup of our energy sector. So that's number one. Number two, you have the global recession caused by COVID-19 with everyone working from home and not able to have foot traffic in downtown to create activity, uh, uh, you know, uh, retail expenditures and food courts, people not being able to buy things, et cetera, et cetera. You have third, um, in many cases, the inability for, depending on the business you're in, uh, be it a tight margin business like a restaurant, to be able to pay your rent, so you've had to vacate that premises or operate as a, as a ghost kitchen, still not being able to make your, your payments, and then potentially your property manager saying, if you can't make the payments, you'll need to leave. You have the other um, uh, uh, issue of the fact that I mentioned that we're overbuilt, so you can't just do what would work in maybe a Toronto or a Vancouver. You need something particularly customized for us because we have so much office space um, and then the fifth is the fact that while all of this is happening, you have less dollars to play with. So it's very interesting to see how you could activate this space, um, get more revenue if you were just throwing money from the government. Actually, the cities can't run a deficit. They need to balance their budget every year. 
And so they've enacted some property tax freezes. You know, people are not taking transit, which again is passive revenue for the city. So the city is playing with less dollars. They have less dollars to invest in placemaking, activation, and all these things as we come out of COVID recovery. And so my challenge to you is, how would you design a strategy that recognizes both the opportunity and the challenge posed by the vacant office space in Calgary's downtown core? Um, you know, what sectors do you think are going to be the ones that potentially drive employment? How would you make the case to them that the built environment in Calgary's downtown core could, could house them, could allow them uh, their employees to be able to, to work? Uh, the, other, the other context that I, I, I neglect to mention in one of the other challenges is, again, the remote work feature. So everyone has understood that it's more cheap to work from home. It's more convenient in many cases. For some, it's a challenge. Um, but how are you going to navigate that? And what would you do in designing a strategy to activate some of this, this office space? So I'll leave it there. Uh, Chris, I'm also available for, for certainly any questions or comments related to the challenge, but uh, happy to turn it back to you and um, uh, uh, answer any questions that, uh, that you or your students may have. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I really appreciate you going through. Uh, you know, out of curiosity, Jason, like from last year, I think the downtown vacancy was about 30%. Where are we at right now, uh, given COVID it's, and everything? Yeah, so so we'd actually um, chipped away at it for a period of time. And so it was, you know, going down to about the, the 27, 26 type range last year, um, in, in large part as well, because um, the, the price of office space just kept going down and down and down and down. So more people were getting out of basements uh, and, and uh, taking up space. But that's ticked up uh, as of uh, the most recent ones that I've seen to about 29, 30. But again, there's a lag in the data. So we suspect it'll be increasing. And uh, we actually just are in the midst of contracting the Conference Board of Canada to do another assessment of not only the current rate, but how theoretically how high could it go? And what would we, so actually, you know, your students are competing with the Conference Board of Canada to be able to determine what that strategy is going forward. And believe me, I am more than willing to take ideas from you guys instead of the Conference Board as well. So uh, yeah, hovering around 30. All right, good to know. Yeah, I mean, you brought up some really interesting points, even about like, you know, childcare and other things that uh, certainly we we never think about, like from a, uh, you know, challenge perspective. Um, you know, I, I think uh, maybe I'll just go through some of the questions that uh, the students, uh, you know, besides actually having um, this, uh, you know, the overall economic strategy, but there were some personal questions that the uh, the students actually asked uh, and so maybe i'll just run through some of those uh, but one was uh, what was it like to be a commentator on cbc yeah it's a it's an interesting question and so i i joined um cbc calgary's uh political panel a couple of years ago and basically it was you know using my expertise in in policy to comment on you know civic affairs provincial affairs and and federal affairs um and so i was i was really the wonk on the panel you had uh pollsters folks who have worked on a ton of campaigns uh i i just served in one or two very voluntary roles previously so i didn't have that much political experience but it was just a, a very very um good privilege and, and what i can say for for students is once you get past the shininess of, you know, being on television and, and all of that stuff, you know, it really focuses on something I think is incredibly important, whether you're on television or not, um, which is having something to say and uh, saying it in a way that resonates with people is incredibly important in whatever profession you're in. And I like, I've stole that quote from the that uh, movie a star is born uh bradley cooper but it's one that always st uh, you know stuck out with me which is having something to say and and, and saying in a way that that resonates with people is super important and so it was a very privileged position to give my analysis and have it you know um, well received um further conversation but i would say also one of the highlights was uh, i actually covered the uh 2018 provincial election and so while that was um, at and and the uh, the federal election as well up to a, up until a certain point um, uh, as well, and so that was just a very unique um, uh, experience to be a part of the political process and then uh, and do it all from this city was was super cool. But again, I would focus on um, for those that are interested in that kind of um, the intrigue of that kind of work 
is to just really focus on what you have to offer, what you have to say, and then refining how you get to say it so that it resonates with people. Oh, that's awesome. Um, another personal question that came up was, uh, what would you define as your biggest moment of failure? Has there been a situation that may have seemed like a failure, but later turned out for the better? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's not a, it's not a, something that I would define as a failure, but the latter part of the question is something I could certainly address, which is, um, you know, you know, what are these sidesteps or forks in the road where, you know, you haven't made good decisions, but ultimately, or, or have failed to try to do something that have ultimately been for your benefit. And so what I would say to you is that, you know, I've been someone in your seat before as a, as a university student uh, in, in my undergrad. And I could tell you in many cases, I was not in my seat. I was not actually going to class, uh, you know, getting up to things that um, certainly you know, deviated me from a path that I'm at right now. And so for me at a very, very sort of young age, um, you know, and quite personal, um, was a heavy drinker, um, was someone who didn't care about doing anything of value for the community, very self-minded. And I think in a certain amount of, of, you know, challenging personal circumstances that I wasn't going to work with uh, or deal with, um, at home. And so all of that contextualized, you know, my years in university, et cetera. And I used to always, once I, you know, put down the bottle and, and got clean, um, always, you know, looked back and said how much time I'd missed, how much I could have been doing this. I could have been doing that. What I can tell you is that when I got my head on straight and, and dealt with some of the issues I was, I was dealing with, it focused me in a way that I didn't act. It allowed me to, you know, you know, go through an education experience that I never took seriously all the way through to now, you know, doing my PhD and being, you know, federally funded by some of the biggest funders in our country um, to working on projects and in, in community with people on these really, really heady issues, you know, having a chair that, you know, I'm the youngest person in the company to, to hold. And I wouldn't probably, I could, I could say I wouldn't probably be here if it wasn't for going through some of that experiences of not meeting my potential, of struggling personally and being super resilient and, and feeling no fear about moving to a city from Toronto where I was living to now Calgary, not knowing anybody and just leaning in and, and rasping opportunity, no pun intended, um, for the betterment of others and, and for the city. And so you know, mental health uh, is increasingly an issue for a lot of folks and a lot of fellow Calgarians. Uh, substance abuse is um, uh, increasingly an issue, particularly uh, with opioids in our community. And so for me, it's to say that, you know, all of those different things have brought me to the point where I'm at today. And so while I can gripe at sometimes like what I could have done and could have used uh, that time uh, for, certainly has led me to a path that by all means looks to be going pretty well. So um, happy to chat with anyone who might be dealing with something similarly uh, for sure. But that's, that was the biggest sort of misstep or, or challenge that's ultimately led me to, you know, good results. Yeah, no, for sure. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you sharing those, um, you know, especially those personal challenges because uh, I know that a lot of people, um, you know, they do uh, kind of uh, have to deal with like, you know, alcoholism and so on. And uh, it's uh, it's one of those things. I mean, I look back, um, I mean, I, I actually stopped drinking now probably 12 years. I was never a heavy drinker anyways, but I just didn't see any value in it. And, um, you know, I, I look at a lot of people in my community, my family and so on, and uh, how it's really devastated uh, certain dynamics that way. So... Um, maybe just getting back to some like positive side of things. Um, there's uh, this is actually more related to your presentation, but uh, there was a student that uh, mentioned that there's a lot of economic development sector work that has been along the lines of digital transformation. And is there something in particular that you are looking forward to for the future? Yeah, I, I think that. Um... Uh, in terms of digital transformation, certainly I think that uh, I'm excited about the potential democratization of tech that can come with it. Right now, you know, it's hard to say if you don't have a particular tech background, 
what your role in a tech enhanced economy really is if you're not a coder or know Python or, or, or have a, a data science or computer science degree. But I think through the way, uh, through a wave of digital transformation, which where you could harness your existing organizational business expertise and matching that with the affordances and augments of technology is certainly something that could be inclusive of everyone if embraced. And so I think, like I said in the presentation, the say Digital Transformation Talent Hub is certainly part of that democratized experience. Actually, Mark Blackwell, who's our, our uh, the chair of the Opportunity Calgary Investment Fund and certainly someone who's, who's well respected within the tech community, really said that. He's like, you know, the access to a typewriter used to be a privilege. The access to understanding how to use particular technologies used to be only for the, the elite, um, um, or in many cases, those that were using tech for the most rudimentary, rudimentary functions like a secretary, uh, and he referenced his mother's story as well. And so the ability to, um, I think, pair this business thinking uh, that our, people already have with, uh, with technology is going to be incredibly um, impactful. But the other thing I think that's really, really cool is just to see the breadth and depth of applications of digital transformation. You know, I was moderating a panel I think I mentioned uh, yesterday, and I, I purposely chose uh, a representative from an agribusiness company, a life sciences company, and a professional services company. And the ag company was talking to me about how much of their um, uh, tech offerings, and they weren't a tech company, they're an international fertilizer company, but how many of their tech offerings have, have come up as of late because of consumer demand, meaning farmers are asking for more digital capabilities. And he said, you'll be surprised how many John Deere tractors have a thumb drive plugged into them, uh, monitoring land use, monitoring um, um, uh, data and, and performance of productivity of, of crops. You're seeing, um, uh, I mentioned the legal example, but from an Orpix perspective, you're seeing how um, a duty of care can be better fulfilled by having access to, to better technology and, and better data. So. All of those application stuff is where I get super excited. And ultimately, it's going to be you guys that are going to be working on that. So I'm incredibly excited about the market opportunity, the business opportunity uh, for companies, but then paired with who actually gets to do that work. Uh, and I hope that uh, some of you guys are the, the recipients of that, uh, that transformation. All right. Thank you. Uh, one thing that I know, uh, and it's funny that a uh, student actually brought this up, was uh, the current tagline for the Calgary economic strategy, which is um, Calgary in the new economy. And I've seen your quite uh, liberal use. I mean, I think that <laughs> maybe we should even create a T-shirt on it or something. But uh, someone did. And, uh, oh, did they? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Like uh, I should have worn it. Uh, someone uh, has has made that T-shirt for sure. Uh, uh, so what do you think the next edition of this header uh, will be like for the the strategy when it is updated? Yeah, I'll, I'll um, you know, I'll, I'll parse that out a little bit. Like, you know, Chris will know this. Uh, new economy is like a very old term, uh, actually. Uh, you know, I th I'm thinking decades old where people were talking about a more internet enhanced, tech enhanced knowledge economy it was, you know, sort of framed as this new economy so it's it's often interesting that um that's that's the name of of the strategy but I'll, I'll take it in two different directions number one i look at the new economy uh much more broader than its original sort of business strategy um sort of use case um within academic circles that emerged uh in in the 90s and i think early 2000s um a new economy is just a, is a better one. So when I talk about things like childcare, when I talk about things like inclusion, when I think uh, about sustainable land use policies, it's just a better economy than we have right now. And so it's about, you know, harnessing the strengths we do have and shoring up the weaknesses. That's our new economy. So I, I certainly take a not only liberal use of it, but but liberal interpretation of, of what it actually means. And then the second thing is, I actually don't think it matters what it's called. Um, as long as the vision is what's actually being um, uh, enacted through decisions, through policy, um, through investment. And so that vision powered by embracing technology, um, uh, entrepreneurship, and solving challenges across our established and emerging sectors, call it whatever you want. Um, but as long as that remains relevant and the play for Calgary, Calgary is not, you know, CD is not positioning Calgary to be Silicon Valley. Calgary is, is uh, economic development is positioned in Calgary to be Calgary 2.0. 
by basically saying, hey, we have core industrial strengths um, and in our established sectors as well that are super valuable to the rest of the world and particularly um, uh, markets that buy our products. But we're, we understand that the future is unknown and technology is coming. And so how do we harness those strengths to be ready for a more digital future? How do we um, support an energy sector through transition that is going to need to be cleaner, need to be more sustainable in the future? Those are the things that we think, I think, define the new economy. So I'll, I'll hedge and not create up a new name on, on the spot, but, but certainly reinforce that it's about the vision and it's hopefully about that strategy not being driven by the top, but by the middle. People making everyday decisions that that align with that ethos and that vision and uh, those pillars that I mentioned in my presentation. You know, uh, one thing I, I think you've addressed this in the the presentation, but uh, the question was uh, with CED, given the recent uh, downfall in the oil industry, uh, what is Calgary planning to do to improve its economy so we can hopefully bounce back and is that more investment in small businesses or technology research? So maybe if you want to just expand on that. Yeah, no, I, I think that uh, certainly crashing oil prices, uh, seeing the the jobs um, um, being being cut during the structural change, and certainly the global recession, is 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 tough. And so first, you, you need to take care of people. Um, and so certainly. While we don't want to play a, a sort of uh, outsized role that gets away from our mandate, we know that we needed to do something. And so we actually created a program called Edge Up, um, which was about, you know, mapping the skill sets and doing the competency mapping for some of these displaced energy workers that in many cases have like, you know, a master's, a PhD, 20 years of experience and provide them with the cultural, technical um, nuanced training that they would need to find employment in other areas. And actually that International Economic Development Council that I mentioned at the beginning that you know did that three minute video uh, on what is economic development, they actually gave us an award uh, yesterday for that program um, on an international basis, along with two others. Um, one was for our uh, Live Tech Love Life campaign, um, which is basically, uh, and I'll send Chris the links, it's basically you can go to livetechlovelife.com and you can see the brand of how does what does Calgary in the new economy really look like? Um, uh, we won a, a paid marketing award for that, and we also won an award for a video that you can see on the screen. Uh, I'll send Chris the link as well, um, or you can you know splice it in here um, about a, a vision for Calgary that matches this Calgary in the new economy um, strategy. And it's the video is called "This Is Calgary." Also won an award. So certainly taking care of people is the the primary focus. The second thing is about understanding our role in providing some light uh, and, and some attention to some of these emerging sectors that are going to be bigger employers uh, in, in the next few few months and few years. And so definitely we, we see our role as if, if, if this uh, side of the, the equation from the energy sector is, is uh, 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 slashing prices, slashing staff, et cetera, how do we get people to pay more attention to the clean side of the energy equation, which is, is hiring more people needing to expand? But then these other entities, like uh, like I mentioned, financial services, fintech, prop tech, um, uh, creative industries, digital, uh, interactive digital media. That's our role. We we do, uh, you know, we I mentioned our budget. That's to market several sectors, both established and and emerging. Name an entity that is going to talk to you about the opportunity in financial services and fintech. It's it it, it has to be us in many ways. So like. We, we have to, I think, uh, see our role as not only driving attention, uh, but results. And so the last thing I'll say is working with orders of government, where you saw on that slide, the innovation strategy that's taking shape, um, investments in AI, ML that were not planned. I wanna make that clear, were not planned uh, when the provincial government uh, took office. Um, when you see the premier's recovery plan that was announced uh, in the response to COVID, literally being almost an identical map to Calgary and the new economy of where they would focus their sectors, where they would focus incentives, where they would focus their strategy is certainly a result of, of us doing that brokering work with government and business. And so, again, I think we've we've come out of this certainly fulfilling our, our mandate, but there's I'm not satisfied. There's certainly more more work to be done. All right, perfect. Um, I didn't touch that. I, I didn't actually tell you about this, but I have this like little bit of a rapid fire questions. So they're kind of lighthearted. Uh, usually cool. I don't share them uh, with uh, uh, the actual speaker, but uh, uh, they're going to be quick, 
you know, just uh, they can be one word answer. If you want to expand on it, feel free. So you're this ready is perfect for timing because I, I have five minutes anyways. So let's hit it. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, do you respect Drake? Oh, uh, yes, absolutely. And, uh, and actually, this I won't do a one word answer. Yes. Um, I think that just living in Toronto um, and being around there at the same time before he was he had blown up and knowing what you faced, he was unique enough to do all the things he's doing now, but that was not an advantage back then. Um, and so I respect what he's done. I respect how good he is uh, at his craft. I think I respect this, the run. This is a run we've seen like no other. I don't, I don't care. Like I'm, I'm a J fan. This is a run that you will, we've never seen across the board um, into, into now clothing and, and, uh, and television production where the star of euphoria won a, won an Emmy the other day, he, he produces that. Like this is, this is just a very thoughtful, well-executed, smart run. So I think it, de it deserves a, a ton of respect. Um, and then from the music side, we'll continue to see if this, per this, uh, performance is still high and whether you can compete at that level, but overall absolutely has my respect. All right. Um, how many hours of sleep do you need? Uh, very little. Uh, uh, need uh, three, two to three hours, and then how much I get? Four uh, on a on a on a good day. But I'm I'm good with uh, I'm good with little sleep. I want uh, I would I should be getting more, but I'm good with uh, little sleep. Okay. Are you politically correct? No, but I'm thoughtful. I think political correctness is like this arbitrary line. I will push the boundaries of what we can say, but it'll always be thoughtful. It will always be kind. I've never heard a, a distinct rationale for why someone would be, hey, I'm not being politically correct, but why that would give you license to not be kind, smart, or thoughtful. And so I, I don't uh, I don't necessarily go with the, the common opinion or, or what's supposedly politically correct uh, much of the time. But I will make sure that if, if challenged or seen as politically incorrect, I'll explain why I have that uh, position. And I think we need a, a hell of a lot more of that. Ask for permission or beg for forgiveness? I, I'd like to say that I'm like the, the beg for forgiveness guy. And I just act like I ask a lot of permission. But if, you, if, if I've said it and um, I don't get a response or it's not timely or whatever, then it'll be asking for forgiveness after the fact. But I always... Uh, I'm not as uh, I'm not uh, this like like a ruthless uh, Gordon Gecko ish kind of guy. Like I can't uh, I can't do that. I'm I'm an ask permission guy. For sure. Uh, what age do you want to retire at? I do, I don't I don't uh, ever want to retire. I'm actually taking like you know you talk about professional development. I'm actually taking a, a um, private company governance course right now for boards where you know on private companies. They don't have a lot of uh, young representation that understands technology. And so it, 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 it uh, impacts the board's ability to scale. And so I could see, uh, I know many of folks are doing that into their, their 70s or, or their 80s. So I, I always, I just think I won't, uh, I may formally retire from whatever role I have last, but I'll never retire from being, uh, being involved. All right. Uh, and Jason, we've covered a number of companies. Um, are, do you have like certain founders or startups that you really admire? Wow, I have uh, I have a lot. Um, I gotta be careful here. I don't want to pick favorites. No, I'll I'll I'll, I'll pick favorites. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I I've really admired and um, become kind of friendly with the the founder of Helsum, uh, Nicholas Beek. So it's a, a payment processing uh, system, and um, and I'll only I'll only highlight him. I obviously love a ton of companies and and founders, and I do want to focus locally, but. I'll explain why, and it's because there's an ethos that I think is not recognized. Sometimes in community and uh, with your company, showing the most and being as loud or as public or you know, as marketing savvy is equated with how strong the product is or the problem that you're solving um, or the flexibility and lifestyle that you're providing to your employees and how you're giving back to your community. And so I, I met Nicholas about maybe a year and a half ago. And I just saw him again as someone who's 
pretty smart, very thoughtful, but I wondered why I hadn't heard more about him. And I, I quickly understood it's because he didn't play the startup-y, foundry type of game where, you know, sending out a press release every week or, um, uh, you know, positioning himself as some kind of influencer. He was just busy building his business and very quietly, and I toured his, his new offices. So Helsim, H-E-L-C-I-M, for those of you who can look it up, uh, they just took up some space in Millennium Tower, scaling company. I think they're going to have about 70 employees soon. And the, the humbleness or the humility and understated nature of how they go about their business, the problems that they want to solve, serving small businesses and retailers. I think in response to COVID, they just partnered with the Chamber on a, a platform of bringing these folks online or uh, these businesses online. It's called uh, Connecting Commerce. Uh, just just a, a stand-up guy. And so the, those are the people that I, I, um, I certainly admire, a company that I think is on, on the rise. Um, and and someone I would I would watch Nicholas Beek for sure. Yeah, no, for sure. I guess one last thing: um, what piece of advice would you give your younger self? Wow, finishing a very philosophical note. What advice would I give my my younger self? Um, yeah, uh, I would say be kind. You know, a lot of uh, you know. I could insert sage business advice, sage, you know, uh, you know, pumping your tires advice. But I, like, honestly, I just think the biggest currency you can have in this world is, is, is being kind. And I'll, the primary example is that I know that if I called Chris and I needed help with something, uh, that he would, he would help out. Um, and he knows that every time he does a course or, um, uh, needs assistance or would like some research or something like that, he knows that I'm going to pick up a phone. And so I just think it's the greatest currency you can have. I've not been, uh, I was not a kind person, I think, growing up in my, in my life. And so certainly that's part of those, those kinds of regrets. But if I could, that's, it's the, it's the cheat code to everything, uh, to prosperity, to family, to fame, to any of these kinds of things that you want, being kind is is the the ultimate best advice I could have given myself, and certainly something that uh, I'd love to reinforce in you guys. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I quite often I tell people, kill them with kindness. Oh yeah, um, and uh, you know, being a, a new dad, uh, I've got a five month old in the in the next room is um, certainly something that, again, that was not a, a prime focus of it being instilled in me. And so I just have a, a super focused lens on doing that now. But I think that the biggest thing is you just mentioned, the kill with kindness is not for how you just deal with your family or whatever. It's how you deal with pe people in business, in academia, everywhere. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot of ROI there. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I see on your screen that you have your email address. Is that the best way for the students or for people to get yeah. in touch with you? Yeah, you can um, uh, uh, email me there. If you want to follow some of what we're up to, um, I'm on you know Twitter and LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. It's it's largely the same same thing uh, at Jason Ribeiro or underscore Jason Ribeiro or whatever. So uh, yeah, and most of most of what I post is all things that we're up to within CED. Uh, Etc. So um, uh, happy to connect with any of you. Have any questions or or just want some uh, insights and proximity into what uh, what I'm up to or or what our company's doing. All right, perfect. Well, thanks again, Jason, for taking the time out of your schedule. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll we'll be uh, you know updating you with uh, what the students come up with later on in the semester. No, my pleasure. Thanks so much.